I'm sure many of us, if not all of us, have gone through these letters, uh, the seven letters of Revelation at some point, uh, maybe sequentially, maybe we've gone through them one to seven, maybe we've just kind of picked out certain ones. What we wanted to do tonight is really just to look at Sardis in particular, uh, the one that we had read for us in Revelation chapter three, and this theme strengthening what remains. You know, it's it's interesting when you consider a letter that was written, uh, because really all of these seven letters would have been would have been read uh, amongst the ecclesias. And so perhaps you've gone through the same mental exercise of just thinking what it would be like if a personal letter was addressed to your home ecclesia. And that's really what we want to think about tonight, is if this letter that was written to Sardis was written to us, what would a letter written to our home ecclesia be about? And I think as we uncover what's recorded here in the letter to Sardis, uh, there are some encouraging thoughts, uh, albeit through a difficult message that we can take some exhortation from. So if a letter was written to your home ecclesia, would the letter, as we see here in Revelation, be supportive of the works that are being accomplished? Or would the letter be a warning regarding the existing behavior and the attitude that we have in our ecclesias today? You know, perhaps we can relate in, in some way to the letters that are found here in Revelation. We're not, though, to be discouraged as we read through these letters. That's not the purpose. It's more about what we can learn regarding our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we're working, are we not, to become the bride of Christ, to be a spouse to Christ as his ecclesia. And so how fitting it is to look into these ecclesias and to understand what was working and also what needed to change and how vital it can be for each of us to just reflect on where we're at. What is our relationship like with Christ at a personal level? How can we look to serve him more effectively? You know, the Lord was speaking to these ecclesias so that they might be saved. That's the purpose of these seven letters of Revelation. There's an encouragement to repent. And so the impetus is on us to recognize in, our, in ourselves, personally first, as well as in our ecclesias, as well as in the greater brotherhood, how we can shape our characters, how we can build our faith, how we too can be seen ready to meet our bridegroom. That's what we're working towards. So tonight, we're going to travel all the way to what was once one of the wealthiest cities in the world. This city, Sardis, was famous for its temples, celebrating the great gods. It was one of the greatest and the oldest cities in Greek antiquity. And here we come to the capital city of Lydia. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to Sardis in Revelation chapter 3. This city itself was actually built up high on the northern slope of Mount Tmolus. It was only accessible with great difficulty from the south. See, this had high sloped rock walls. You can just imagine something that was completely set apart. It encompassed most of the city around. And it was thought to be almost impossible to scale the surrounding cliffs. Historians note that this was a place known to be proud, to be rich, and to be impregnable. And yet we read together, didn't we, in Revelation chapter 3, speaking to the Ecclesia in Sardis these words, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. See, here, brothers and sisters, was an Ecclesia that was viewed well by the surrounding Ecclesias. They were held, even as they lived, in high esteem. They were known and they were spoken about as this thriving Ecclesia this healthy spiritual model ecclesia. And yet we see in the eyes of God, in the words of our Lord here, they're the exact opposite. They're pronounced dead. And just for a moment, picture, if you can, being here in Sardis. Think about the emotions that we might experience to have someone open this book and read this letter about our ecclesia. Think about reading the circumstances of this particular ecclesia, because it's all laid out before them. This was written in a time when the gifts of the Spirit were still flourishing, and yet this ecclesia was dead. How could that be? Sardis, we know through history, was actually destroyed by an earthquake in AD 17. It was rebuilt, but never to its same former glory. See, it had a name that lived on. But the former glory was dead. 
See, this, brothers and sisters, was a stagnant ecclesia. It was an ecclesia resembling the city wherein it met. Now, the letter addressed to Sardis was from he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And these are phrases, aren't they, that we come across elsewhere in the book of Revelation. They actually appear back in in Revelation chapter 1 and verses 4 and verse 20. But we want to just come forward from Revelation 3 to Revelation chapter 5. Just turn with me two pages, maybe one page in your Bible, to Revelation chapter 5. It's a helpful verse if you have your pencils out. Just to put beside Revelation 3 and verse 1, put in here Revelation 5 and verse 6. This is what it says to us. It says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. See, here, the seven spirits are the seven eyes. See, it's the sevenfold, all-seeing power of God. But these seven spirits, by these seven spirits, what Jesus is making clear, Christ is making it clear to Sardis in Revelation chapter 3, that he encompasses the seven ecclesias. See, brothers and sisters, Christ was watching even though the ecclesia was not. Sure, they were probably very busy. Others viewed them as alive and vigorous, but perhaps they weren't working on the right things. They performed, as it were, no self-examination. They never questioned their own motives. They were, as one brother put it, self-sufficient, self-confident, and self-indulgent. And so this ecclesia needed the life of the Spirit. It needed to be re-energized, as it were. The seven stars are, of course, an echo back to Revelation 1 and verse 20. The leaders in these seven ecclesias who were responsible for the direction and the defense of the lampstand. And sadly, here in Sardis, they were dimly lit. They weren't awake. And our Lord here is able to perfectly assess their spiritual state. That's a first important point for us irrespective of how we view our ecclesias, our Lord can perfectly assess our spiritual state, just as he does here for Sardis. I know thy works, he said. It's the familiar phrase that we see throughout these letters, but we notice a pattern if we just trace our way back through chapter two. We put them now here on the screen. Hopefully you can see it. But you'll see here, Revelation chapter 2, here's the letters to the Ecclesias, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, and to Thyatira. And see, following this phrase, I know thy works, we always read this commendation by our Lord. Yes, many of the other Ecclesias had issues, but there was a recognition of the positive that followed this phrase in chapter 2. I know thy works, and then something positive that was done about them. And yet, brothers and sisters, when we come to Sardis, there's no works worthy to be talked about. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. Brothers and sisters, there's an important lesson to be learned in these opening verses when we're considering Sardis. Because this was an ecclesia that everyone talked about. This was the model ecclesia with a well-spoken name. And yet they were dead. It appears that part of the problem lay in the fact that the works they cared about were only those that gave this ecclesia the favorable appearance. And so this ecclesia was thought to be alive. In the eyes of those around this ecclesia, it was vibrant, it was thriving. In the eyes of God, it was the very opposite. And here in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 3, just a few more passages for us to pencil in. To put in here in our margins, because as you see on the screen in 1 Timothy 5, in James chapter 2, we see the very same problem identified and called out by God. There was a problem in this ecclesia. It was a lack of faithful action. Works being done to the show of a good name, but they were empty. They were meaningless. And so we have this picture on the screen of how this tree to the eyes of men looks beautiful and lush. But as you come around the backside to where God sees, it's dead. 
there's nothing living. And so perhaps this problem lay in the partaking of the pleasures of this proud, rich city. Here was an ecclesia that was about to be humbled by the words of our Lord. You know, brothers and sisters, it's not easy to see ourselves as God sees us, is it? Often we like to think of ourselves a little bit higher. Just think about the example found in the book of Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar. How did Nebuchadnezzar view the nations of the world, and how did God view them? See, Nebuchadnezzar was viewing this magnificent statue, and the head of gold represented him and his kingdom. And yet from God, the very same kingdoms of men are put forward as what? As beasts. See, here Sardis viewed itself as alive, but in God's view, they were dead. Here was an ecclesia with a reputation. Yet through apathy and self-satisfaction, they didn't live up to it. And you know, what's interesting, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Because there's no specific error that's mentioned. We read that in other letters. Perhaps they were too apathetic to even care. You have a name of being alive, our Lord said, but you are dead. You know, there's a quote that's taken from a book. It's titled Christadelphian Standard. And it hits home for us on the name that we hold, brothers and sisters, as Christadelphians, as brothers in Christ. Just think about this as it relates to Sardis. It says the name Christadelphian, just like the name of this Ecclesia Sardis, came into existence when it was necessary to distinguish the brethren from other so-called Christians. Ever since, that name has stood for the one faith and for separation from the present evil world and its religious social, and political aspects. Brethren in Christ, a high and noble calling, an honorable name, has it lost its meaning since it first came into being. The Ecclesia at Sardis had a name that it lived, but it was dead. They called themselves brethren in Christ, and they had a high reputation, but in Christ's estimation, they were like the Pharisees, whited sepulchers, Outwardly beautiful, but inwardly full of dead men's bones. It goes on to say, the salt can lose its savor. The name Christadelphian can become a misnomer borne by a people who have become false to the truth it signifies. Lax, latitudinarian, and worldly, let us remember, brothers and sisters, our proud and exalted appellation. See that it never becomes tarnished, dishonored, or meaningless. It is the fact that is important, not the name. If we call ourselves Christadelphians, then let us be brethren in Christ, in that we hold his truth unimpaired and follow his example of holiness. I thought it said well there, brothers and sisters, and it makes us think as we just consider these six short verses in Revelation chapter three is this name alive in us, brothers and sisters? Or are we Christadelphians just outwardly for show that they know and, and understand who we associate with, but inwardly we're dead? You know, the instruction that was given to Sardis was what? Revelation 3 and verse 2, the very first thing they were told to do was to be watchful. It's a word that means to keep awake. And in Eureka, it was actually Brother Thomas who wrote this phrase as become watchful. See, it's a subtle change, but it follows in the narrative of this, this ecclesia needed a drastic change. They weren't watchful, so they had to become something that they weren't. And there was an immediate need for spiritual alertness to recover the lost sensitivity that they had to the truth. See, the, the Lord here is sharing with Sardis a consistent message that's found throughout the New Testament. Don't think for a second, brothers and sisters, this can't happen to us. Just consider the common message that's found throughout the New Testament. See, in Gethsemane, Jesus asked the three disciples to do what? To watch. Paul told the elders in Ephesus to watch, and to the Thessalonians, his instruction was, not sleep, but watch. 
And we see now through the book of Revelation, throughout these letters, the Lord would use words and phrases that would have a double meaning as he wrote these letters, relevant to the words themselves, but also holding a deeper significance for the ecclesia. See, here in Sardis, this was a city that was proud, that was confident in their position where they were located, high on a hill with rock walls that were thought to be impenetrable. And you can think of the pride that this would have brought out in them. No one can touch us. And yet history showed that two times this city became overconfident in their position. In BC 546, in BC 246, Sardis was defeated. See, they didn't take proper action, brothers and sisters, to carefully watch. And the city was overcome by their enemies. Get the picture, Christ is saying. Don't be like your city. Don't be overconfident. Don't think just of yourselves as the name only. It's what we profess and practice. Be watchful, he said. Weymouth actually translates Revelation 3 and verse 2 in this way. It says, rouse yourselves and keep awake and strengthen what still remains, though it is on the point of death. See, the word strengthen that comes right after be watchful, it means to set fast or to fix firmly. See, we see that not all were dead. Not all were dead. Not all were on the point of death here. Nearly so, but not all. See, of course, this ecclesia appeared to be thriving, yet on they, they were on the verge of dying. And so how important it was to fix firmly the problem areas. Don't just patch work in. Fix it firmly, they're being told. See, the Lord had not found their works perfect. They were not fulfilled, as the word means. The ecclesia's heart was not in the works that they were performing. Nothing was perfected. Nothing was completed. Remember the, the, the verses we had just on the, the slide, a few previous in James chapter 2. James, we know, is all about how works are unacceptable without faith. And the majority of this ecclesia was not fulfilling the vows that they had made at baptism. Because in the RV, brothers and sisters, the last phrase in verse 2, it reads like this. I have not found thy works perfect before my God. See, this is personal to our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus took this attitude and this behavior, the lack of life in this ecclesia, personally. And it's just helpful for us to think about it in this way as we go about our own discipleship. We have to see our own vows in this light. It's a vow that we have made before our God. And as we go through the waters of baptism, we make a vow to our God. We leave the old way of life behind, and we follow the example of his son. That vow, brothers and sisters, needs to be carried out. Our Lord takes it personally when we don't work to fulfill it. Faith without works. It's taken personally. Now, we won't turn there, but just think of the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 8. When he explains the parable of the sower, in verse 14, he says, And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they had heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. See, the instruction to Sardis was to remember what they had heard, to hold fast onto it because their works were not perfect before God. See, they could have been just like what was talked about there in Luke chapter 8. Those that fell among thorns. They lived in a very rich, prosperous, one of the greatest cities in Asia. The pleasures of life had slowed down the fulfilling of the works, the vows that they were to perform. No fruit was being brought to perfection by the majority of the ecclesia in Sardis. And so they're told to hold fast. You know, it's the same word that's translated keep 
found throughout John's writings. It's actually one of John's favorite words, interestingly enough. He uses it more frequently than any other New Testament writer. 37 times the emphasis in place is placed in John's writings on keeping or holding fast. And isn't it interesting that one of the antidotes to the problem facing the ecclesia was to call to mind how they first received the gospel. That's what they're being told. Hold fast. Remember how you first received the gospel. Remember, they're told. You know, there was a study done in July of 2015. Um, a place I had never heard about, maybe you have, the, the Cognitive Neuroscience Institute at University College London. It's a mouthful, but they did a study. And it was interesting because what their study concluded is that when we recall a previous life event, something that had happened in, in, in our life many years before, our brains have the ability to reimmerse ourselves in the entire experience. There's a specific part of our brains, the hippocampus, that basically lifts us and places us there. When this is activated in our minds, event memories, they say, are pieced together like a jigsaw puzzle. We start first by remembering the room that we were in, the person that we were talking to, the sounds that are being made, the words that were being used. And here, Sardis is being told, go back to that event. Remember, Sardis, the excitement that you had when you first received the truth. Remember the topics that motivated you to commit yourself to God, the room that was bursting with energy at the gospel being preached. Hold fast to that. You know, brothers and sisters, there's a simple lesson in this for each of us. Because there may be times when our faith is weak. Perhaps we're attending meeting or Bible class lectures in a show of appearance, but we'd rather be somewhere else when our zeal for the truth is dull and is fading. Our Lord's advice is to go back in your minds to the excitement you felt when you truly received the gospel message. Go back in your minds to a talk, a study that lit you on fire. Go back, brothers and sisters, to a conversation with a brother or sister, with a young person that motivated you to dig deeper into the word of God. Go back and remember the day that you were baptized. Just think about the joy in the eyes of those who witnessed it. Remember the eyes of the little ones at the Ecclesia, actually, Brother Dan uh, and I were baptized at. We used to have our baptismal tank in the basement, and they'd welcome all the, the little kids to come up. <laughs> And they'd huddle closely around the baptismal tank, their hands on the tank, just watching intently as you went into the water. Remember that. The emotions that everyone had that you had when you first truly listened and were intent to hear the gospel message, when you responded to it. Remember the embrace from your new family in the Lord as you exited the waters of baptism. Remember the, the hymns that were sung, the prayers that were offered. Hold fast onto the incredible hope that we share. What an exhortation, brothers and sisters, for us to consider from here the Ecclesia in Sardis. That's their instruction. You know, this Ecclesia had received the truth. And whether they regarded it or not, the permanent deposit was already made here in Sardis. And they were reminded of the need to watch over it, to take care of it. And ultimately, in the middle of verse 3, to repent. That word repent, it means to change one's mind. To change one's mind and purpose. And once again, action is shown here to be a requirement. I remember a brother once saying that we won't enter the kingdom of God in an armchair. And I say that as I'm sitting here in a bit of an armchair. But what his point was is there's a need for action in our life. We can't just sit back and have the word of God told to us. We have to do something with it. And the members here in Sardis are being compelled to get going. Don't take this instruction seriously. And I will come as on me as a thief, our Lord says. You have to take it seriously. You have to do something with it. Otherwise, I will come on you as a thief, Jesus says. You know, a thief only comes when there's something to be taken. 
And a thief often comes when there's something of value to be taken. And if they didn't repent and keep awake, they would be taken by surprise in the coming judgment. You know, the natural remedy, of course, for drowsiness is to get up and do something. And look at the direction that's shown in verse 3. The aspect of remembering speaks to the past. The aspect of holding fast speaks to the present. And the aspect of being watchful speaks to the future. (laughs) See, they are being told that there's no time for tardiness in the life of a follower of God. Whether the past, the present, or the future, there's always something that can be done. See, holding fast requires intense commitment and energy. Repentance requires ownership and action. Watching requires alertness and focus. Being dead means it's impossible to accomplish any of these things. See, for Sardis, remaining in the current state was not an option for their ecclesia. There had to be a change. And yet we read that not everyone needed a change in this ecclesia. There were some who had not defiled their garments. There were some with life in them. You know, it's a comforting message that's found here in this letter, that even amidst the prevailing theme of an ecclesia that was dead, the Lord knows them that are his. And here in Sardis, the few good among the bad were not being overlooked. And that phrase, put on, in chapter 3, We have it there that they were to put on. It says there that it actually means to array or to clothe. It's this idea of sinking into a garment. It's the covering of forgiveness that we get, that we receive at baptism. And these brothers and sisters were fulfilling the vow that they made at baptism. They were putting on, clothed in righteousness and true holiness. They had not defiled their garments. Now, as we've seen here in Revelation, let's just turn over to Revelation chapter 16. We want to just come to Revelation chapter 16 quickly in verse 15, because we see the very same themes that are found back in the letter to Sardis. Revelation always picks up on little things as it goes through, and it holds to key themes just like we see here in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 16, verse 15. Notice the connections. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. See, considering the cover, the covering, the garment that was received at baptism for the remission of, of sins, sinners are said to be naked and that their sins expose them to death. And so the warning here in Revelation 16 is that if we're not baptized, we are naked in the spiritual sense, still in our sins. And so to defile our garments is to be baptized, but not living a righteous life. It's showing a disobedience to the desire from God to be pure in our thoughts and in our actions. Let's just turn back to the book of Jude. There's another connection that we see here in the book of Jude. We see it just develops our appreciation for the exhortation that's being presented to us a little bit further. A few pages back, the book of Jude, we'll just look at uh, verse 20 to 23. It says, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and of some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. See, let's just connect this to the letter to Sardis. Because to the letter to Sardis, those in the Ecclesia, there were a few names, weren't there, that had not defiled their garments, meaning that the majority already had. How had they soiled their garments, given we don't read of any immoral behavior? Well, perhaps Jude verse 23 is telling us they didn't hate the garment that was spotted by the flesh. See, Sardis was known for its life of luxury and ease, a self-indulgent society that perhaps had affected this ecclesia. 
In your margins here in Jude, beside verse 23, maybe just make a note to Galatians 5 and, uh, and verse 24. We read there that they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. See, keeping ourselves unspotted from the world is to keep our garment clean. We are not, we are in the world, but we are to be not of it. We're not living for the present, brothers and sisters. We are preparing for the future. You know, it's important for us to, to fully appreciate that the Lord is indicating here to Sardis that there is the possibility for our garments to be defiled. And it happens when we allow the spirit of society to influence us. See, brothers and sisters, we must not allow society to adversely affect our lives and our service in the truth. It's no different for us today than it was here in Sardis. The same possibility still exists to become lethargic in our watchfulness, to loosen our grip from holding fast and to have our garments defiled. And so how important it becomes for us to watch out for the dangerous spirit of humanism, to be aware of the damaging effects of apathy, to recognize the dangers of blurring our separation with the world to ensure there's not a re reduced focus on doctrine in the days in which we live. Those who had not defiled their garments would have had the task here of helping revive the ecclesia, igniting life into what was about to die. You know, in our day, this can manifest itself in ensuring that we spend time on strengthening the hope that binds and unites us, strengthening our friendships in the ecclesia that sharpen and encourage doing what everyone's doing here tonight, strengthening the shared understanding of doctrine, ensuring the truth endures forever. You know, this would have been a difficult task in Sardis. It would have been labor intensive work, at times perhaps frustrating, but for those who could endure, who could hold fast and overcome, they would be clothed in white, made immortal like the bride of Christ spoken of in Revelation 19. See, here is the symbol of the new and clean nature imparted on all those who are made the subject of the promised transformation of the Spirit. What a hope that this ecclesia has. Theirs would be a name written in the book of life. If they could overcome the record of the names of those who will receive everlasting life after the resurrection, when Jesus returns to this earth, you know, God knows us. God remembers those that are his. But it's recorded in such a way here as if to, to write it in a book. It's recorded in such a way here that we can understand and grasp the significance. The visual that's provided is impactful for what it implies to us. See, our names, brothers and sisters, are not guaranteed in the book of life. That's what it says there in verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name. Meaning that there are some that will be. See, the onus is on us to guard it once it's written, so to speak. And perhaps it's just a ha helpful graphic for us just to think about that as we face decisions in our own lives. With this decision that we're about to make, cause our father to consider erasing our names or perhaps to write over our names so as to bold it <laughs> we may think twice about certain actions or decisions with this in mind supporting certain behaviors taking part in particular activities saying certain words being an active participant in in watching this or that movie indulging in this or that vice are these things brothers and sisters enhancing or erasing our names in the book of life. You'd like to think that if a letter like this was written to our ecclesia, the words alone would make us sit a little straighter in our chairs. The fact this, that, that this would be read in the local ecclesias, the one who held you in high standing, they would now recognize the true state of your ecclesia. Surely there'd be a motivation to change your ways. Here was an ecclesia that was promised much, but had performed little, who were failing to practice what they professed, who were not applying what they claimed. And yet Christ, in writing to them, was giving them another opportunity. 
What remained was on the point of death and would die if action was not taken immediately. See, this ecclesia is seen as a type of the city itself, having been conquered on multiple occasions. At the time of John's writing, Sardis would have been a shell of its former city. And yet we see here that they would have been wasting away, former glory gone. They couldn't miss the obvious connection. And yet for this ecclesia, Christ took time, penned by John, to give instruction, to provide care from our Heavenly Father, who's not slack concerning his promise, who will have all to be saved, brothers and sisters, but something needed to be done. Action was required. There's another uh, helpful quote in this context for what it forces us to consider about our own lives and our own ecclesias. It's in the book called The Letters to the Seven Churches of Asia. It says, we begin our career in the truth with enthusiasm and zeal, but the years pass. The response to our preaching is meager. Problems arise in ecclesial life and the Lord does not come. Imperceptibly, our efforts may slacken. We tend to leave our work only partly done. Our toil, endurance, and zeal, our love, faith, and service alike diminish. Bible study becomes superficial, and preparation for an address is done a few hours before it is to be given. We do not base it on real Bible study because we have not left ourselves time for this. We become reluctant to undertake the work for the ecclesia. Is this a picture of our ecclesias, brothers and sisters? We must not become nominal nominal Christadelphians just keeping in touch so that our name is not on the absence list. Would your employer accept the quality of the work we offer to God or reject it as inadequate? We must not allow our Lord's verdict on us to be that which he passed on Sardis. The truth must not become a mere addendum to our other interests instead of life's main purpose and thus fail to bear fruit to maturity. See, the lesson from Sardis, brothers and sisters, is one of overconfidence and apathy. The original enthusiasm for the truth had now waned. Other interests had crept in and edged out time for God. It's a letter that should cause us just tonight, even just to reflect a little bit. We see how the ecclesia at Sardis left off personal honesty in self-reflection. So let's be honest with ourselves. As we draw our thoughts to a close tonight, We just thought we'd turn back together to Luke chapter 13. If you just come back with me to the gospel of Luke chapter 13, it's here we have recorded the parable of the fig tree. And we just want to pick up together, reading from Luke 13, verse 6. Jesus speaking here, he says, He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. See, for three years, brothers and sisters, fruit was sought on this tree. And with nothing to show, the order was given to cut it down. But a request is put forward to allow just one more year. See, we see there's a fair chance that's going to be given. And the owner of the vineyard is patient, offering another final opportunity. See, brothers and sisters, we too have much to be thankful for. And this letter given to Sardis is another example of that. You and I serve a merciful God. If we have lost our first love, if we struggle with the entanglements of sin, if our faith is weak and starting to wane, let's remember the exhortation that even a dead ecclesia was given an opportunity to repent and find new life. Get up. Keep moving forward. Because God is still working with us. If the Ecclesia in Sardis didn't work at it, he would come upon them as a thief. He would bring the judgment and he would cut down the tree. But the encouragement for us 
is that we believe in a God who does not wish failure upon us. We will be assisted in ways we sometimes cannot understand or comprehend. So then, brothers and sisters, what are the exhortations? As we just bring our evening to a close together, what can we learn from the letter to Sardis? Well, perhaps we just simplify it to four things. Firstly, here was an ecclesia that was acutely aware of their name before men, yet they allowed it to be forgotten before God. Perhaps in our own lives, we will be put in positions where the honor of men and women is alluring, positions and titles at work, acclaim in academia, success. Let's take a lesson from this letter. Reflect on how God truly sees us, because that's what matters. Second, this ecclesia was told to remember, to recall and to go back to the feeling of excitement when they heard the gospel and they learned the truth. You know, the very same exercise can prove helpful for us. Go back in our minds to the joys of the word, of study, of ecclesial events, of study days, the day of our baptism. Let's keep our ecclesias alive and active. Let's never forget what it is that unites us and excites us. Thirdly, we noted how the city of Sardis was broken up and defeated two times in history. Without knowing, they become overconfident. Their position was thought to be impenetrable, but they got too overconfident. The enemy advanced upon them. See, brothers and sisters, the world can affect us, sometimes too late before we even realize it. And so the lesson from Sardis is to post a, a guard and to watch. And it's not just the signs of the times, important as that is, but it's also watching ourselves. It's watching each other. It's ensuring that we don't defile our garments. And lastly, let's take the exhortation that even a termed dead ecclesia was given an opportunity to repent. There's a quote that says, no matter how far you've traveled in the wrong direction, it's never too late to turn around. And so maybe in our walk, we feel this way, facing west when we should be facing east. There's an opportunity to turn around, but there needs to be a willingness on our part, actions associated with it. So let's focus, brothers and sisters, on uniting our discipleship and our faith and our ecclesias, bringing life in the way of an enthusiasm for the truth and its message of hope and salvation. Let's bring energy around the activities in the truth. Let us strengthen the things that remain. God can and God will work with us as long as we show that willing attitude to hold fast, to repent, and to overcome. And God willing, when our Lord returns, may we be found watchful, active in the service of the truth, strong in the faith, so that we too may share his table.